You are now listening to episode 19 of the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. Side effects. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. Dr. Taylor Crick. So in 2004, there's a kid called Matthew Holman, and he was, he was brushing his teeth in his parents' bathroom, uh, and his dad looked at him and says, Matthew, we're in a hurry today. We've only got 10 minutes. I'm going to go downstairs, finish brushing your teeth. I'll see you down there. Do you understand? Said, yeah, I got it, Dad. No problem. The dad goes down. 10 minutes comes and goes, and he says, Matthew, what's the holdup? No answer. Matthew, what's the holdup? He goes up there and he finds his son, lifeless body, dead on the bathroom floor. And Matthew had died suddenly from taking an ADHD medication. Okay, and that's one of the side effects. And I'm, before you know, I make any judgments on the ADHD medication, let me explain this. So then, the in 2004, the medical examiner says, "Hey, you know, this 10-year-old kid, he died suddenly. Took it to the FDA, and the FDA said, well, we we put." sudden death on the side effects. So we're, we're not going to change our, our recommendations. We put that, that is a side effect of ADHD medication, but it's very rare. It's a very rare side effect, so we're not going to change our recommendations at all. Okay, so that was in 2004. In 2009, somebody named Gould did a study to find out how really rare these events are. And what they found when they really analyzed all the literature that had ever been done on these medications, they found that children who were prescribed ADHD medications, like I was myself, are seven times more likely to die of sudden death than those that aren't on those prescriptions. Okay, and that's the reason, you know, why we're doing this workshop tonight. You know, not for Matthew in particular, but because that was somebody's son, that was somebody's brother. And that's happening with all of our the medications today, is that a lot of the stats that we're going to go through, that's somebody's mom, that's somebody's daughter. Uh, you know, even when we talk about, you know, 500, 600,000 people a year, those are all people and those are all statistics, uh, but they're people with lives and with stories and with families, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What I would really wish that I would have titled this, uh, you know, thinking of it today, is Side Effects of living in the medical model. Because I'm not just going to go through a list of medications and say, well, this medication gives you dry mouth, and this medication gives you, uh, you know, diarrhea, and this medication gives you constipation, and this medication gives you... I'm not just going to read through side effects. You guys read enough magazines, you, you watch enough TV, you've heard all the side effects. You know that the side effects are out there, and you know that there, that there are a lot of them. Right, But what we're going to do is we're going to explain the effects, the side effects of living in a medical model because that's what this really comes down to and I'll explain what I mean by living in a medical model. So why this workshop? You know, we always start off with the why. So the reason why this workshop is why, because so many people are on so many medications. There are 70% of all Americans are on at least one prescription drug. Okay, 70% of our country. We are 5% of the world's population. And guess how many, guess how, guess the percentage of the world's drugs that we take? Any guesses? We're 5% of the world's population. How much of the drugs do you think we take? 50? Good guess. More than 50? What do you think it is? A guess? Yeah. 75. We're 5% of the world's population. We take 75% of the world's drugs. We take into the 90 percentiles of the world's psychotropic drugs, antidepressants and ADHD medications. We take the largest dosage by far of pain medications. And that's, you know, a big problem. Americans, we spend more than $329 billion on prescription drugs. You know, we have a $2.7 trillion healthcare system, and we're spending $329 billion just on prescriptions alone. Do you guys remember, some of you guys have heard this before, do you remember what number we rank in life expectancy in the world? Any guesses? Last, not last, because there are a lot of, 
a lot of countries, last in a lot of studies, when they study us against other industrialized countries, we, we do consistently rank last. But last summer it came out that we rank 51st in overall life expectancy. And yet, we're still spending all this money towards these prescriptions, which we continue to get sicker and sicker and sicker. So another reason, you know, 9 out of 10 Americans that are at least 60 years old say they've taken at least one prescription drug within the last month. 90% of people. Uh, over 70 million Americans take mind-altering drugs. Okay, and these are the scary ones, in my opinion. These are the ones that increase your risk of violent behavior, increase your risk of suicide. That's 70 million Americans. There's 250 million prescriptions written for antidepressants a year. Okay, it's one in four women. One in four women aged 18 to 44 are taken in antidepressant. 25% of us. Okay, so that's why this workshop. Another reason why you can see at the bottom there, the suicide rate for Americans between the ages of 35 and 64, it rose by close to 30% between 1999 and 2010. The number of Americans that are killed by suicide is now greater than the number of Americans that die of a result of car accidents. And a lot of you have heard this maybe with our, with our military. Do you guys know that now that suicide kills more American soldiers than combat? We lose more when they get back to them taking their own lives than we lose with them giving their lives up for our country in war. It's craziness and it has to stop. And that's why we're doing this workshop. The last thing is kids. In 2010, the average teen in our country was taking 1.2 central nervous system drugs. And not every single teen is on one, right? But that means that there were enough teens that were on more than one that it averaged out to be 1.2 per teenager. Okay, so these are the drugs that we're going to talk about that treat ADHD, that treat depression, treat, treat things like seizures. The central nervous system is affecting your brain and your spinal cord. Children in our country are three times more likely to be prescribed antidepressants than children in Europe. And it's not because we're three times more depressed, it's because they're three times more available, they're three times more marketed, there's three times more commercials, there's all these direct-to-consumer things that makes us three times more likely, even though our kids are just as healthy and just as happy and just as normal to begin with as they are in Europe. So that's why we're doing this workshop, you guys, because this is a problem. And do you guys agree that this has become a problem in our country? The thing with this is that so many people realize this. They realize that it's a problem, but they don't know what they can do about it. Okay? And so the number one thing that you can do, we're not going to tell any of you to go home and get rid of your prescription. We can't legally do that. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to empower you to change your thinking to get out of the medical model. We're going to go through five categories of drugs and just talk about some of the most common side effects, some of the lawsuits, some of the things that you might not know about these categories of drugs. But what I want you to really do is start to think about it from a different perspective and start to think about it outside of the medical model. You guys have seen this next one on our back wall right there. and It says, I take aspirin for the headache caused by the Zyrtec I take for the hay fever. I got from the Relenza for the uneasy stomach, from the Ritalin I take for the short attention span, caused by the Scopoderm teas I take for the motion sickness. I got from the Lomatil I take for the diarrhea, caused by the Xenical for the uncontrolled weight gain, from the Paxil I take for the anxiety, from Zocar I take for my high cholesterol because exercise is a good diet, and regular chiropractic care are just too much trouble. And I know some of you are doing those last few things, exercise, diet, regular chiropractic care, but you got to be doing it for a long time. But you got to get out of the medical model and the medical way of thinking. And that's really what I want the focus of tonight to be, is what is the difference between living in a medical model and living in a chiropractic model? Okay, so what does it mean to be living in a medical model? Okay, so first off, that is most people that you know. That's probably yourself. It's probably is me before I learned about this, okay? So my dad's a dentist, so a lot of you guys know my story that my dad's a dentist, and so he can prescribe drugs. So when I grew up, I mean, uh, uh, we're a Tylenol family. Uh, we never took Advil or Aleve, but Tylenol, you know, it's one of those things that you're 10, 12, 14 years old, and the Tylenol is just in the cabinet. There's no limit on it. It's if you got some pain, go grab a couple. You can do it at any time. But that's the least of my concerns. For me, it was antibiotics, 
because you could prescribe antibiotics, right? And when you get a tooth extracted, what are you going to go home with every time? Antibiotics, right? So he's very, very accustomed to prescribing those. Anytime we had a sniffle, a cough, a sneeze, even if he didn't tell us, we would just go grab him out of the cabinet and take a week's worth of antibiotics. It's crazy, but that's where most people are at is in a medical model. And they don't think that it's crazy. They think that, they think that I'm crazy. You know, somebody came in this morning and I said, my girls have never been to the doctor. And they looked at me like I was crazy. But when you start to think about this, you start to pull yourself out of the medical model, you start to really realize, well, who's crazy here? Uh, but the medical model is symptom-based, right? It says, where do you hurt? How can I help you? How can I get you out of pain as quick as possible? We talk about that all the time, that there are no quick fixes or you're going to be paying for it later. It's symptom-based. It tells you a medical model tells us that we are sick. Right, that we are broken, that we're going to die if we don't take this medication, that we're going to die if we don't have this procedure, that we're going to die if we don't do this medical uh, procedure or treatment or therapy or technique, and it's fear-based. It puts fear in you. It tells you that you're broken, that you're sick, that you need a kid needs this inhaler, that you need this medication, that you're weak. It also comes from a synthetic and artificial standpoint. You know, it's what can we do? What can we create in a lab that's going to lower your blood pressure? What could we create in a lab that's synthetic that might boost your thyroid hormone on a thyroid test? What can we create in a lab that's going to help change X, Y, or Z blood test and just get us the results that we want to see on there? The other one is that it's, it's fear-based. We mentioned that one. The opposite of that, though, the opposite of that is a chiropractic model. Okay, and so this is chiropractic philosophy. So since chiropractic was discovered in 1895, there's been over 50 volumes written on chiropractic philosophy, and this is what it says. It's function-based, right? And this is function-based, and nowadays there's functional medicine. There's functional nutrition. There's functional exercise like CrossFit, but it all comes from the same mindset, and you have to have a paradigm shift. That This is function function based. It tells you that you are strong, that your body is strong, that your body can take on anything, that your body was designed to be healthy, that you were designed in his image, that you were designed to be perfect. It says that you're powerful, it says that your body is amazing and that you can fight anything, you can take on anything in the world if you're giving your body what it needs. It says that it's natural, right? We always talk about foods by God versus foods by man. We always talk about you can eat a food that was grown on a plant. You can't eat a food that was made in a plant, right? It's natural. It says that everything that we need to express our God-given health potential is here given to us on the earth. It's natural, and it's faith-based, okay? And that's not, that has nothing to do with your religious beliefs, but it's a faith that your body was designed to be incredibly powerful, that your body was designed to do the right things at the right time, for the right reason, as long as you step out of the way and you give it what it needs. That's the difference. So that's what I want you guys to start thinking about tonight as we talk about these five categories of medications is, you know, why would somebody be taking this medication? And it's because they live in a medical model. And you, and you think about, well, how would somebody that lives in a chiropractic model, how would they approach the same problem or the same medication, then you're going to get the wheels spinning, and that's when it's really going to change your life, okay? Because like I said, we're not going to tell anybody to go home and just throw away your medications, but the only way to start decreasing them in your life, in your friend's life, in your family's life, in your neighbor's life, is to change your thinking. So can everyone agree with me with, on that, that we're going to change our thinking? Can everyone uh, repeat after me and say, I state your name. I, Dr. Taylor, I am going to try... To think about things, think about things from, a from a chiropractic model and withdraw, and withdraw myself out of the medical model. Of the There's nothing better that you could do for yourself than draw yourself out of the medical model, but it's not easy. It takes time. And so hopefully, if you haven't already begun, hopefully tonight we'll get your wheels spinning and start helping you pull yourselves out of the medical model. So the first category of medication that we're going to talk about are the pain meds, okay? So pain meds. Why do you guys think that this is the first category that we're going to talk about? 
Are they easily accessible, yes or yes? Yeah. Are they a problem in Utah? Yes. Okay, so those are the two reasons why I wanted to talk about them, because they're the most commonly prescribed or the most commonly purchased, right? You know, some of them don't have to be prescribed. Tylenol is found in over 600 products and ingredients. It's everywhere. And now the thing with Tylenol is we begin to think, oh, it's over the counter, it's safe. But what's going to happen if you take the whole bottle at once? How, how well are you going to be doing? You're not going to be doing too well. So what's happening if you do it slowly over time? The exact same thing is happening. It is responsible for 80,000 hospitalizations a year. Tylenol. Just Tylenol alone. It's the leading cause of liver failure. Over 50% of acute liver failure in our country is caused by Tylenol. And that's because it affects your liver's functions. But it's also, it's a toxin. Your body has to detoxify that. So even though you bought it over the counter and you can pop two in the morning and pop two in the afternoon and pop two at night, your body has to clean that out and it has to detoxify that. So you're putting a heavy stress and strain on your liver. A lot of these medications do that, can create liver failure and can create kidney failure because some of those are some of your filtration and your detox organs. That is the number one acetaminophen or Tylenol. Probably the number one most abused medication too. Easy to overdose also. The next one is NSAIDs, okay? So these are your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. This is your Advil, this is your Aleve. Aspirin is technically an NSAID, but it usually falls into its own category of aspirin is, you know, separate than Advil and Aleve oftentimes. But these can also cause severe, sometimes fatal, GI bleeding. It's said that every time that you take an aspirin, you bleed out, uh, I forget the stat, but it's something like uh, a teaspoon. I forget teaspoon and tablespoon difference. But it's quite a bit. It's a little glass. That, that's how much your body bleeds every single time that you take an aspirin because it causes internal bleeding. It leads to, it can actually lead to heart disease, right? Because why do most people take aspirin? To prevent heart disease or to thin their blood, right? An antiplatelet, anti coagulant, but a lot of these NSAIDs, Aleve, Advil, Ibuprofen, can actually lead to an increased risk of heart disease. It can actually worsen your high blood pressure. can cause kidney failure, and long-term aspirin use increases the risk of GI bleeding and ulcers. So the reason I wanted to start off with this one is because it's the most accessible, but also it's the most, uh, the least understood, right? Because we think that because it's over-the-counter, that it's safe, that we can take as much of it as we want. It's out there everywhere, and I just want you guys to be aware that every medication that you're taking has an effect. Okay, so we call it side effects, but it's really, they're really effects, aren't they? You know, the medication is changing things in your body, and because of that, you're having effects. Maybe the effect is shortness of breath, maybe the effect is runny nose, maybe the effect is constipation, but it's not really a side effect it's an effect of the medication. Other over-the-counters, there's over 100,000 100, hospitalized annually just from over-the-counters. So that's what I want to start off with is by saying that you know just because they're over-the-counter doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe. But the bit, And here's a slide that shows how easy it is to overdose on them. So this is an extra strength Tylenol. But what this is showing, this is a slide that shows how it is so easy to overdose on Tylenol. Because say somebody takes, you know, a couple of Tylenol in the morning, they're going to work, right? They take 800 milligrams before they go to work. Then they take a NyQuil when they get home. Then they get a Walgreens pain reliever with a PM in it before they go to bed to help themselves sleep. And it's 6,600 milligrams of Tylenol within a day. That can easily cause liver failure, right? And for a lot of people, you know, when I see this, I picture, you know, maybe some of my construction worker patients that are, a lot of times it's guys, like, ah, it's fine. I'm fine. I'm just going to take a couple of Tylenol. I can work through it. But this is what's happening every single day. And then they're surprised when 10 years later they have a heart attack or they have liver failure or they have another concern. They develop cancer. And this is where it's, where it's stemming from. The bigger concern here in Utah, though, are these, right? The prescription pain meds. Do you guys know that we're the worst state in the country for prescription drug abuse? At one point, we were sec uh, we were double. Our prescription drug abuse was double 
what the second highest spending country was. So we're really bad with prescription drugs, right? And opiates are the worst. Those are things like Oxycontin and Percocet. And there's over 2 million Americans that are addicted. Okay, and the long-term side effects are infertility, osteoporosis, depression, heart failure. But honestly, those aren't the long-term side effects that we're concerned with. The long-term side effects are the side effects of addiction. And addiction can ruin lives. I mean, it, do- it ruins lives. It ruins your brain. ruins the way that you think about things. But, you know, it ruins relationships. Uh, and I'd never seen anything like it until I moved here that Chelsea has so many friends from high school that have been addicted to, to these medications. And it's a pretty common problem. I had no idea. I've never known anybody to be addicted to anything, really. Maybe cigarettes. But this is a really, really common problem, and especially around people my age. These are the street drugs that they're getting and taking these days, and it ruins lives. And you, all you gotta do, drive up Third West, do a lap around Pioneer Park and come back, and you'll see it. Right? There's addicts out there, and if you had any of this, they would love it. Right? And it's not the heroin and the crack anymore, it's getting their hands on the pain medication. And that's where it ends up leading to, is to the harder street drugs. The other big one, pain medication-wise, are the steroids. Things like prednisone, things like cortisone. Uh, if you type in, like to Google, type in, you know, what are the most dangerous drugs, a lot of the lists will have these at number one. Prednisone and cortisone, the steroids. Long-term use of them especially. Like over two weeks is long-term. Okay, and so that affects, it literally affects every single system of the body. Uh, and there's over 100 known side, of, side effects. These are known side effects. It suppresses the immune function. And one of the biggest things that these steroids can do is suppress your adrenal function and actually cause, cause adrenal fatigue and adrenal burnout. It's called secondary adrenal fatigue or adrenal burnout, which means that it, it didn't come out of nowhere. It had a primary cause. And the primary cause were these medications long-term and the secondary effect was that your adrenals no longer work, which are what, you know, are the workhorses of your energy system. Uh, so your adrenals are incredibly important for all of your functions in your body, but especially energy, uh, all hormone production regulated by the adrenals. Very, very important stuff. But the pain meds, the pain meds are the first one that I wanted to talk about because they hit close to home, right? They hit close to home because we've all got, not me, but we've all got Tylenol, we've all got ibuprofen, we've all got these meds at home. So keep your, you know, keep your cabinets safe with your kids, but also they hit close to home because of what we see here in the state of Utah, the pain meds. The second one is one that had a, you know, a huge effect on my life. And it's one that I, I absolutely despise. Uh, it's antibiotics. Okay. And so now antibiotics, life saving, you know, the invention of them. They saved a ton of lives in World War II when they were first invented. Literally saved a ton of lives. But we've started to overuse them so much that it's absurd now how much they're being prescribed. I just read recently that 700,000 tubes are put in kids' ears each year. Every single one of them is getting getting an antibiotic. Every single surgery, every single procedure, everything you're getting, you're going to get an antibiotic. I had a patient in today. Her son, he is 14, he's a little older than my girl, so probably 16 months, took a round of antibiotics wasn't getting better. So she went back and told the doctor, and the doctor said, well, we're going to give him another round of the same one. And she said, well, I don't think it was working. She went to another doctor, got him tested. They, w- they refused to test him at her doctor, at her pediatrician, got him tested, and it was penicillin resistant. So she went back, took that back to her main doctor, and they said, well, we didn't do the testing, so we're not going to believe that. We're going to still try to prescribe you the same medication. You know what she did? She found a new pediatrician. She, she fired him. You know, doctors want to fire their patients. We should be firing the doctors if that's the way that you're being treated. Uh, so she got rid of him, but that's how so many people are doing. We, Chelsea, when she was pregnant, she got put on an antibiotic, and she said, well, I don't want to be on this. And then, you know, like two weeks later, the, the doctor said very nonchalantly, huh, must be viral. After two weeks of, the, of being on the antibiotic and it wasn't working, okay, well, I guess we found out that it's viral. So they're figuring this out by trial and error, which is crazy, but it's four out of five Americans a year, 250 million prescriptions. Okay, and that's in humans. 70% of our antibiotics are given to our livestock, and we're getting them from eating the food, from drinking the water, 
They're, they're, they're all over the place. And the number one concern with these, one of the biggest concerns, and you guys have probably heard this, is the, the resistant superbugs that are now out there in the hospitals and things, that there are no antibiotics to kill them. Because these bugs, these virus, or these bacteria have mutated so many times that they're resistant to these medications, and now there's nothing that can kill them. That's scary. That's very scary. But so, 50% of the prescriptions that are given to kids, unnecessary. Okay, 50% of the, uh, of the times that kids get them, you know, a lot of times it's for ear infections, uh, ear, nose, and throat type things, and over 50% of the time, completely unnecessary. With that, there's many studies that link antibiotic use to cancer, including breast cancer. Um, in fact, breast cancer, you know, there's a, a, a very, very solid linkage between antibiotic use and cancer. And what they've found is that it's the more times that you've used them, the more, the higher your risk of cancer gets. Over the past number of years, the number of dosages that you've been on, there's a, there's, you know, a calculator where they've tested people in different intervals and found out that the people that used them the most, that used them consistently for over nine years a lot of times, or especially over 500 days, 500 day round of antibiotics, so a year and a half round of antibiotics, a long time to go, but that was shown to have a dramatic increased risk of cancer. There was a study done in 2008 where they uh, looked at over 3 million participants. It was actually the, the whole population of, of Finland. They tested the Finnish population. And their conclusion, this is a quote, it says, in conclusion, antibiotic use predicts an increased risk of cancer. So when you're affecting the immune system, when you're having the immune system fight, you're helping it fight its fights for it, it gets weaker. You know, the immune system is a lot like a, a little kid. And if you fight its fights for its whole life as it's growing up, how tough is that kid going to be as an adult? Not very, right? Because you've fought all its thoughts for it. you got to let it t- toughen up. And that's the same thing with the immune system. The thing that it does, the thing that it does that I hate the most, that and why it causes this, and what it did in me, is it destroys your gut flora. Okay, so anti means no, biotic means life. Okay, so it kills all the life. Now that's good when it's killing the bad bacteria, but there's good bacteria in your body too, right? We've talked about it. You guys have heard me talk about this. It's one of my favorite topics. The good bacteria in your body outnumber your cells by tenfold. You have 750, you have 75 trillion cells in your body. You have over 750 trillion good bacteria. They're responsible for almost every function. 70% of your immune system is located in your gut and your bacteria controls that. How about thyroid hormone? Think that's important? Your gut bacteria is responsible for the conversion of thyroid. It turns T3 into T4. It's also responsible for your body being able to produce the right amount of serotonin, which is, if you've heard of that, you know, we'll talk about the serotonin drugs in a little bit, those are your antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Serotonin is your happiness hormone that's created in the gut. So when you take an antibiotic and it wipes out that gut flora, it can affect every aspect of your life, every aspect of your health. And that's what it was for me, you guys, is right away, you know, I had tubes in my ears before I was nine months old. Uh, I had them in probably a dozen times my first five years of life, in and out, in and out of surgeries, in and out of hospitals, got to know it really well, took antibiotics all the time. I've, I, since I've been about three years old, I can't use penicillin. I'm immune to penicillin completely, the number one prescribed antibiotic. Um, and, you know, that's, that's how it started for me. Then that turned into a couple of the other meds that we're going to talk about. ADHD in high school. Turned into ear, nose, and throat problems, sinus infections, where I'd miss a week of school. Uh, turned into, you know, childhood problems. Uh, shortly after, you know, the ear infections were crazy. But then all, everything in that area, I was constantly in and out. Round of antibiotics, then it'd be fine. Then back in, throat, throat problem, back in, then it'd be fine, ear problem. And it kept cycling through. Uh, but what it does, there are, that's, excuse me, that's where it started for me. So antibiotics, that's number two. That is one that, and you know, with that, I'd like to throw this out there that, you know, there's, 
a time and a place for an antibiotic. I'm not saying that I would never take an antibiotic by any means. If I'm on my deathbed or, or even if I have an infection that's, you know, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, MRSA is an incredibly powerful, limb threatening, life threatening disease. If that happened, sure, absolutely. But they're widely, widely overused. And so I haven't used one now in 15 years. My girls probably never will. I don't see any reason why they would ever need to unless something serious came up that we knew that an antibiotic was going to help. Number three are the heart medications. Okay, so this is typical after you've had a heart attack is that you'll, this will be what, what you'll be taking is usually like an antiplatelet drug like an aspirin, um, an ACE inhibitor, which what an ACE inhibitor does is it uh, loosens the blood vessels, allows them to expand easier. A beta blocker, what a beta blocker does is slows down the heart rate. Uh, a statin, which lowers the cholesterol. A blood pressure drug is common. Uh, nitrates for chest pain, very, very common. And now listen, if you've had a heart attack, we've got a lot of patients that have had heart attacks. Okay, If you've got a heart attack, I'm not telling you to stop taking these, but this is quite a cocktail of five to six drugs together. Of course, there are going to be side effects. So the common ones for somebody that's had a heart attack, dizziness, cough, feeling sluggish, upset stomach, headaches, arm pains, flu-like symptoms, blurred vision, gas, memory loss, irritability, tiredness, constipation. And when it's gotten to that point, um, yeah, the medications are, are, are probably necessary, but there's so many people that are on heart medications that don't need to be. And the one that I want to focus on the most, the most commonly prescribed medication in history, and it's statins. Okay, so we're going to do a special focus here on statins. It's one in four Americans over the age of 45. 17% report side effects. That means that you go to your doctor and you report it to them and they record it. Okay, so that's one, uh, almost a fifth of people, but they're vastly, vastly underreported. It's linked to over 300 different side effects, and the FDA has required special labeling, special labeling additional warnings, just because statins increase the risk of liver damage, memory loss and confusion, type 2 diabetes, and muscle weakness. A lot of times people put, being on a statin, you'll have to have your liver enzymes measured because it can cause us terrible Can you say again what statin is supposed to do? Yeah, lower cholesterol. Yeah, so that's things like Simvastatin, Prevastatin, but the, the brand names are Lipitor, Crestor, the things that end in or a lot of times are, are what the statins are. So that's your cholesterol lowering medication. And what they found with these, now, so what we want to look at is, you know, what we want to look at with the cholesterol is, you know, who says what your cholesterol is supposed to be? Who says mine's supposed to be the same as yours? Supposed to be the same as yours. Supposed to be the same as yours. Supposed to be the same as yours. Who says these guidelines? The pharmaceutical company sets them. That's the scary thing. Is before 2004, 130 was considered a safe LDL level. After 2004, it was lowered to 100 and even 70. They said they want it to be below 70 for people at high risk. But then they, they did some ongoing research, some further research, and found this is just not, not right. This was not supported by what the medical research said. So they said, well, why did they lower the standard? Well, they went back and they looked at it, and eight out of the nine doctors that were on the panel that created the guidelines to say, hey, your cholesterol should be 200. You should be below 300 total. Your HDL, your LDL should be this, should be that. Eight out of the nine of the doctors that discover and, and create the guidelines had, far, had ties financial ties to the pharmaceutical companies. So of course they're making these guidelines low. They're selling, Lipitor is the highest selling drug in history. Statins are the highest selling category of drugs in history. Of course they want to sell more and of course they want to lower the guidelines. So some of the times people are being put on these things, they shouldn't even, they're not even in the gray area yet but they're being put on them so far too early. Really, really common side effects are depletion of CoQ10, that's a big one. But one of the most common that I hate to see is uh, memory loss. And we've talked to a lot of people about that, that once they start taking a statin, their memory starts getting foggy. And when they stop taking a statin, their memory comes back. We're talking people in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s that should not be losing their memory yet. I don't think anybody should be really, but 
uh, and they're starting to lose it early, their brain's starting to get scrambled. There's books out there about this. That's one of the most common side effects. But what they found, so not only are the guidelines a little skewed, but here's one of the reasons why. This is, you know, it's a big, big advertising thing, and I wish that we could see this whole thing. This is a, a very, very common ad, a very popular ad, and it says Lipitor reduces risk of heart attack by 36%. Okay, so you're flipping through Time Magazine or Newsweek, and you see that, and you just keep flipping. What are you going to think? Oh, that's pretty good, right? If I could do something that's going to reduce my risk of heart attack 36%, that sounds pretty good. I might consider that. 36%, right? What that means, what that means is that in a large clinical study, patients taking a sugar pill, out of every 100 patients, two of them had a heart attack. Out of every, no, three of them had a heart attack. Out of every 100 patients taking Lipitor, only two of them had a heart attack. So three out of 100 or two out of 100. Not a very big difference, but because that difference, they're able to skew these numbers to show that 36, that it reduced the risk of heart attack by 36%, when really the number needed to treat, that's an important number with drugs, is what is the number of people needed to treat before one person is helped? The number needed to treat with Lipitor is 100. 100 people need to be, need to take Lipitor for one person to get an advantage from it. For one person to be helped. Something's wrong with that? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, here's another one with statins. The study that was published in the journal Atherosclerosis showed that statin use is actually associated, so statins, you know, to fight heart disease, actually associated with a 52% increased prevalence and extent of calcified coronary artery plaque compared to non-users. Calcified coronary artery plaque, that is what, what heart disease is plaque on the inside of your blood vessels, the exact thing that statins are supposed to fight against by lowering your cholesterol. And do they work for lowering cholesterol? Heck yeah. They do. You can take one. Your cholesterol could be 300. You could go in and your cholesterol the next time will be 220. Right? They're going to lower the number. But the thing that you want to start thinking about, thinking about it from a chiropractic model, from a function model, is how's that happening? At what cost is that happening? And I'll show you what it do, does. So one more study, another one that said that uh, the current belief that cholesterol reduction with statins actually decreases atherosclerosis. The drugs may actually stimulate atherosclerosis and heart disease. And they looked at a few of the mechanisms at which uh, how this does it in that study. There's four big mechanisms that they said that why it was stimulating heart disease and stimulating atherosclerosis. The first one is that it inhibits vitamin K2 function. Vitamin K2 is necessary. It protects your arteries and it keeps plaque levels down. And statins have been shown to decrease the, the levels of vitamin K2 in your blood and the effectiveness of vitamin K2. The other one was it damages your mitochondria. So mitochondria are your cells energy centers. So if your mitochondria is damaged, it's going to literally affect every aspect of your life because your cells can't create enough energy. Another big one is it interferes with coenzyme Q10. That is one of the biggest side effects of statins. That's why anybody that's taking a statin should be taking a CoQ10. And we've got a great one up on the shelves that are raw CoQ10, but this is one of the one of the supplements that I took today was a CoQ10. I took it with a fish oil and with a vitamin D because it helps fight inflammation. Really, really important. And in fact, when we've done our blood and urine testing that we do here, this has been, without a doubt, the most common thing that we've seen. Almost every single person we've tested has been low in CoQ10. Almost every single person needs it. Um, but, yeah, so what, what statins do is they actually interfere with it and decrease the active CoQ10 in your body. The last thing they do is they interfere with selenium-containing proteins, and selenium is a really powerful antioxidant. Okay, so it fights oxidation, fights, kills free radicals, really, really important stuff, and it's blocked by statins. So sure, can you take somebody's blood and show them at, at 300 on their, on their cholesterol and then have them put on a statin and then show them later at, at 220? Absolutely. It can lower the cholesterol. But is that really the whole problem? Just the number on the sheet? At what cost is it lowering that cholesterol? This is what it's doing to the body. That's why it's leading to so many side effects. Okay, so number four 
fun category here, pending lawsuits, okay? These are all the medications. Actually, this is, this is not all. I had to delete a lot of them to fit them on the slide. This is a lot of the medications that currently have pending lawsuits. So Abilify, does anybody know what that one does? Depression, Depression yeah. How about Accutane? Anybody heard of that one? Yeah. Acne, I took that, yep. Uh, yeah, so, and we'll talk about it, but uh, yeah. The class action lawsuits, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, severe birth defects, yep, I took that one. Avandia, Avandia, has anybody ever heard of Avandia? It's a big one, scandal-wise. Avandia was linked to over 100,000 heart attacks. Like it caused a hundred thousand heart attacks, huge controversy, big fine in the in the four to five million dollar range, or billion dollar range for the fine that was slapped on Avandia. But you know that's that's the cost of doing business to the pharmaceutical companies. What's it for? Diabetes. It's a diabetes drug. Yeah, diabetes drug shown the increased heart attack and stroke. Um, Crestor. Does anybody know what that one's for? We just talked about it. Cholesterol. Yeah, it's that. Yep. Uh, Cymbalta. And they still Oh yeah, big time. Some of these lawsuits are, are for different, for various reasons of like, they lied here, they lied there. Um, Cymbalta what? Cymbalta is, uh, disease. Yep, depression again. How about Depakote? Depression, seizures, so. Dep- depression. Why not? I don't remember what the lawsuit is. You'd have to you'd have to look it up. Some of them, like Depakote, I was reading about this one earlier. That one is that it it causes liver failure and it causes um, like physiological things. Some of them have pending lawsuits because they claimed that it helped with this, and there, there's no research to support that. They claim that uh, you know an antidepressant can also has also been shown to help with diabetes. And there's no research to prove that, so they've mismarketed it for some of them. A lot of them, uh, you know, they're literally causing physiological symptoms like Accutane, like Depakote. Speaking of Depakote, yeah, one, there's one right here that's Depakote that I was looking at earlier. Um, so that's one that, you know, patients have been able to get off of. Effexor, Fosamax, does anybody know what Fosamax is for? Bone, bone mineral density. Uh, another big marketing thing, you know, there's, there, osteoporosis, huge marketing thing. Lipitor, Marina, Marina. We've had patients, does anybody know what that is? It's an IUD, an intrauterine uh, birth control device. We've had patients have weird, unexplained symptoms, horrible symptoms, go and get their Marina removed, and literally, by the time they walked out of the doctor's office, the symptoms went away and never came back. Hormone replacement therapies or, or contraceptives are absolutely horrible. They trick your body into thinking that it's pregnant at all times, so it doesn't get pregnant again. The other one is Yaz. Yaz is a big one. That has, oh, what did I just read earlier, 12,000 pending lawsuits attached to it. Um, and that one is, is, yep, stroke stroke and heart attacks. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, the only reason I've heard of it is because I remember a commercial for Yaz, and it's like, you know, four or five girls, and they're out, out at a bar or something, and the the one girl's talking to him about how great Yaz is, and she says, remember, I'm a doctor. And so it's like a, a, a little play where they have the doctor on the commercial talking about how safe it is and how awesome it is, but then in reality, you know, it's just a commercial. Testosterone, does anybody know what that's linked to these days? We've talked about it before. Heart attack and stroke. Testosterone, a uh, big one that you'll see, you know, class action lawsuit commercials for now. Every Every form of testosterone is linked to this. So it's patches, it's the creams, it's the pills, it's every, it's the injections, all of them are replaces. Hormone replacement therapy is not on here. Hormone replacement therapy, this goes back 20 years, that that's been linked to, to increased risk of breast cancer for years. 30 to 40 percent increased risk of breast cancer for hormone replacement therapy, like in menopause, or like there's an, uh, one of the side effects things on the back walls for one called Premarin, which, uh, is an acronym, actually, it comes from Pregnant mare's urine, premarin. Uh, but yeah, that's 30 to 40 percent increased risk of breast cancer. That's been known for for a very long time. So the, there's a lot going on, right? Vioxx. We're going to talk about Vioxx a little bit. Vioxx, big scandal there. Increase the risk of heart attacks. They swept 
the research under the rug. Vioxx, they say, killed more Americans in five years than the Vietnam War did in ten. Pain. Pain, it's an anti-inflammatory. So, yeah, uh, it's one that my mom was on. Okay, and so we're gonna, I'm going to talk about, you know, the ones that, that I've been on personally and the ones that my family have been on, and that's a big one. That's a huge one. Here's another one, though, you guys, is, is a lot of people don't realize this. Vaccines. You know, we're not going to talk a lot about vaccines um, and, and go into them a lot. This isn't a workshop necessarily on vaccines, but it is important for you guys to know. In 2011, the Supreme Court ruled that vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. Okay, so they're, I mean, obviously they're still giving them. It wasn't saying we're going to stop giving them. But here's the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. So you guys know that vaccines and vaccine injury, there's a compensation program that's been set up for parents whose kids have been vaccine injured. And a lot of you guys have been patients here for a while. You know some of our vaccine injured patients. We have several. And, and I'm not talking like they think they were vaccine injured. It's like they went to the doctor, they got a vaccine, the kid never spoke again. The kid never used the restroom again. The, their, their kids never, you know, made eye contact with them again. Immediate. But here's what's going on with the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. So the total payout to date is $3.1 billion. So they paid out to parents and families. But look at this. Look at the trends of this. So the average payout from 2005 to 2009, $75 million. A lot of money. But now look at it. From 2010 to 2014, the last four years, look at how it's jumped from 75 million to 220 million. Because so many parents are now realizing that that's what's happened and they're going to the vaccine court and they're getting compensated for this. So it's going through the roof. There's almost 2,000 cases pending right now. And here's the thing is that the FDA admits that only about, only as few as 1% of the serious adverse reactions are actually reported. And the CDC, they give it a high number, 10%, only about 10%. So it's between 1 and 10%, but it's still, the fact still remains that, you know, 1 in 68 have autism. Right? And, and I'm not saying that vaccines cause it, but pretty stinking good correlation. Um, and, and this isn't, you know, this isn't controversial. You know, if you get on Facebook and things like that, you think, oh, well, vaccines are completely safe. This is completely controversial if you're anti-vaccine. The Supreme Court is the one that's determined this and the one that's paying these families. Not my decision. It's the Supreme Court. It's not no longer controversial. But then the last one, the last category, the scariest one, are the psychotropic drugs, right? The mind-altering drugs. So these are things like your psychostimulants, your ADHD, your ADD. This is your Adderall, your Concerta, your Dexedrine, your Methylphenidate, uh, Ritalin, Focalin, Methylin, most of the ADHD drugs that people are, are taking today. The antidepressants, those are Celexa, Lexapro, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, uh, Wellbutrin's a very, very common one. Uh, the antipsychotics, those start getting a little, little less common. Risperdal, Abilify, Zeprexa, Seroquel, and then the anti-anxieties, Xanax, uh, not as common as it used to be, I'd say, Lunesta, Clonopin, Ambien, who knows what Ambien's for? Sleep, right? Uh, Valium, too, so anti-anxieties. These are the scary ones, you guys. These are the ones that I want to finish up with. This is also big business. Okay, these are the top five selling drugs in 2014. Abilify, 7 billion with a B. Cymbalta, almost 3 billion. Lyrica, almost, almost 3 billion as well. Vivance, 2 billion. Namenda, almost 2 billion. Big, big, big money involved with these drugs. And that's the scariest thing about them. Uh, and the sales, you know, they haven't slowed down. The sales have actually rose 90% in the last four years. 2016, they're expected to be 12 to 14 billion dollars for ADHD drugs alone. It is big, big, big money stuff. The reason why, the reason why, you know, this one is the category that I want to finish with and the one that I want to talk about the most is because this is the one that I was on that affected my life the most. Okay, the ADHD meds. They're, uh, the, the chemical structure. 
Have you guys heard this before? The chemical structure is literally the same as amphetamines. So methamphetamine that people abuse, exact same thing. Literally the exact same thing. Uh, it's a Schedule II controlled substance, just like cocaine, just like heroin. Um, and there's no known, the scariest thing about this, there's no known test to diagnose ADD or ADHD. No, not a single known lab test that you can do. There's no blood test, there's no urine test, there's no x-ray, there's no MRI, there's no brain scan even to diagnose ADD or ADHD. It's 100% subjective. And when you look into it, the people who have made the subjective rules for it, guess who paid them? The pharmaceutical companies. When you start to dig into this, it's scary, scary stuff. And here's the thing, it's all based on a theory. It's a questionnaire. It's a, yeah, a questionnaire. And say, so, yeah, like I could easily go and get prescribed it again. But here's the thing is, I remember when I was a kid, I remember what I felt like being on this, and I hated it. You know, I had, uh, I had dry mouth all the time. I was jittery. I didn't sleep for days. Literally days. I mean, I'd sleep a couple hours a night. But then every couple, every couple days, every four or five days, I'd come home after school and I would just crash and sleep the whole night through. Because I didn't sleep very well. I had no appetite. But man, oh man, I could, I could focus. Right? I behaved better. You know, and I understand why they're prescribed, right? I wouldn't have wanted to be my teacher in, in, in high school. You know, I wasn't exactly easy. I wasn't bad, but I wasn't easy. But I can understand why, you know, why you think people want, need to be on them or why a teacher would think so or even why a parent would think so. But, it, and it's not to say that they're not there aren't some people out there that do need them. There's a lot that don't. Here's the thing, as like I said, based on a theory, and so the theory is, is that in your brain you have these receptors that release this, this neurotransmitter called dopamine. Okay, so dopamine, if you think about that, the only thing you need to know about dopamine is that when dopamine is released, you can concentrate on one thing very hard. Okay, and so it's also like, uh, you've heard the term adrenaline junkie. When you're an adrenaline junkie, you're really a dopamine junkie. That's what's really being released is dopamine. Okay, and so the theory is, is that there's these broken receptors that aren't producing the right amount of dopamine. And the theory is, is that the drug is going to go to these broken receptors and it's going to cause them to start producing the right amount of dopamine, right? But the theory's never been tested and it's never been proven. And in fact, I shouldn't say it's never been tested. It was never tested until 2013. It's still never been proven. It's only been disproven. Okay, so what they found out when they started doing brain scans of what these drugs are actually doing, what they're actually doing is instead of, instead of making those receptors produce more dopamine, they're making the whole brain produce it. So this is the brain without Adderall. That's the brain with Adderall. And so what they've shown is that, you know, this is kind of like if you came to me and you, and you brought your car in, like Ryan, you brought your car and you, and I'm a mechanic and you say, well, my car's just not going very fast. It needs a little more pep. I say, okay, I've got just the thing for you. We're going to rip out your brake. We're going to toss that on the floor because you don't need that anymore. We're going to take your gas pedal and we're going to tie it down. So that way every time you start it, your engine's just flooded with gas. Your car's not going to have any choice but to go faster. That's exactly what they've done with the brain is just flood the entire brain with dopamine, not just the broken receptors, flood the entire brain with dopamine. That's what the red is, the entire brain with dopamine. And of course, it's going to get into some of the broken receptors. Of course, it's going to be increased where it used to be decreased. Of course, you're going to be able to concentrate further. But that has long-term side effects. And here's the next one. Top one, top brain scan. That's somebody's brain while they're on cocaine. Bottom brain scan is somebody's brain while they're on one of these medications. Do you see any difference? They're shockingly, shockingly similar. Cocaine and Ritalin act on the exact same sites in the brain, cause the same short-term effects, cause the same long-term effects. Incredibly, incredibly scary stuff. Are you guys familiar with the research on these meds as far as like school shooters? and things like that. Found that n now there's so many school shootings that I don't think it's 100% anymore. But for a long time, it was 100% of school shooters were either on or coming off of an antipsychotic drug. Okay, and so that's scary because it makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do. Some of you guys have heard the video that we play 
where a lady, her name's Gwen Olson, she used to be a pharmaceutical rep until her six-year-old niece poured burning oil over herself, lit herself on fire, and then hanged herself while she was still burning. And she says in the video, she says, six-year-old girls don't hang themselves when they're not on medication. That's not normal. Okay, so these are incredibly, incredibly scary. The last thing that I want to just close with is, you know, what's my personal experience and why am I passionate about this? Well, because like I said, you know, not only was it antibiotics for me, uh, antibiotics, I believe, is what started it. Destroyed the gut flora. That controls a lot of other things. There's also subluxation in my spine right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. Destroyed my potential. But then Concerta was the one that I was on. Schedule 2 controlled substance. And like I said, you know, I remember how it made me feel. Accutane was another one. That's the one with class action lawsuits right now for causing severe birth defects, uh, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease, digestive issues uh, right now. So I was on that as well. Uh, my wife, okay, so, so my two, you know, most important people in my, in my life, other than my daughters, my wife and my mom, right? So my wife was on Paxil. Paxil is an antidepressant that she was put on for anxiety. She was 18 years old. And she lived in the South Loop of Chicago. So she's going to get some anxiety. <laughs> um, but so they put her on this medication. And this is, you know, a long time ago, but there are 21 FDA warnings. Not just side effects. 21 FDA specific, like black box type warnings on Paxil causing suicidal thoughts, behavior, and risk. 11 warnings causing birth defects. Five warnings causing hostility and aggression, four warnings causing anxiety, four warnings causing self-harm, two warnings on Paxil causing death. And then my mom was the last one, like I mentioned, that my mom was on Vioxx for, for a really long time. Okay, and so Vioxx settled for $4.85 billion, with a B, dollars, and dramatically increased the risk of heart attack. Killed more Americans in five years, like I said, than the Vietnam War did in 10. And here's here's the scariest part. This is the last thing that we'll end with and then show one more slide. This is just in Paxil. These are news stories that don't don't make it out of the news. Here's on Paxil alone. Here's one week on Paxil in in July of 2010. Man commits suicide became worse on Paxil. Father says son became worse on Paxil. Son kills self. Family files lawsuit against Glaxo for suicide of man on Paxil. Man leaps onto tracks, verdict of suicide, Paxil. Here's one, I remember when I printed this off and highlighted this, 22-year-old co-ed, college co-ed kills herself. Okay, that could have been my wife, right? The Vioxx thing, that could have easily have been my mom. The Accutane, the Concerta, who, who's to say that it's not still me? And I would consider my family relatively healthy. This is just happening to everybody out there unless you get yourself out of the medical model. And what's happening is that people are drowning. And if you walked by a pool and somebody was drowning, would you help them if you could? Would you? Yeah. Right, you'd throw them a lifesaver, right? And so that's the last thing that I want to say is the patient appreciation days that we're having right now is an opportunity to throw out a lifesaver to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, to your neighbors, to somebody you know that's taken a medication that they might be able to get off of, to somebody that you know that's dealing with a health problem that they might be able to reverse. They might be able to lose weight. They might be able to get rid of a chronic disease. They might just be able to get out of pain so that they can once again just enjoy their life. But this week is the best opportunity for you to do that. And that's with our side effects patient appreciation days. We're going to have some fun games, some fun giveaways, and literally appreciate our patients the rest of the week because we do appreciate you guys greatly. But the other thing is it gives you an opportunity to have your friends and your family and your loved ones come into our office and get their spines examined and checked. All they got to do is bring in three drugs. Right? We've had somebody already bring some in this weekend. Bring in three drugs. Any don't have to be pharmaceutical. It can be Tylenol. It can be cough syrup. 
bring in three drugs, throw them in our drug tank, and your new patient exam and x-rays is only $20. It's the lowest that we do it all year. Uh, it's the best opportunity for your friends and family. But once again, like I said, everybody that you see, the next 10 people that you're talking to, you might not be able to see it then, but they're drowning in the medical model. And we really all are. And luckily, somebody threw me a lifesaver a few years ago. And I've thrown that thing out to a lot of other people and my friends and my family. Uh, but that's the exact same thing that I need you guys to do. Because we can change this. We literally can change this. But it's we can't do it alone, right? And it, and it doesn't happen by going to Washington, D.C. and marching on Capitol Hill. It happens by coming to a workshop like this. And it happens by you telling a friend and you telling a friend, and you telling a friend, and then the next time they tell a few friends, and after that, we've got a movement going. Okay? So that's our goal, that's our mission in our office, is to get more of these thrown into our drug bin so that they're not going in to your friends, your family's belly. Okay? But otherwise, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for bearing with me, too, with the patients. With, but yeah, anybody, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Otherwise, thanks for being here. Thank you for listening to the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.